or this is what happened to Condor, this is what the Chomash people say. Hmm. One time long ago, the Condor was out in the air, soaring in the air, and spiraling, spiraling, you go far, far up into the sky. And one day when he was way up there, he looked way down to the earth, and he saw this golden spot down there, and, he, and condors are very curious. They want to see what everything is. He says, hmm, what is that little gold spot down there? He turned his wings, and he started sailing down. And got kind of dark. The light turned to black. And all of a sudden, his face started burning. Oh, he said, holding his wings, and he went back up all his feathers had been burned off he would sailed into a fire and he did not know that what had turned black was smoke and all the smoke got all over his white feathers and when he had turned to come back up he had closed his wings like this and so now when Condor you see him he's all red in the face from when he got burned and his feathers are gone and when he raises his wings up like this, it's white under here because he had covered up that white when he closed his wings. That's what the people say, what happened to you, Condor. There was a time back around 1987, actually before that. At one time there were many, many Condors. And when ranchers started to come, to the areas of the condor. The ranchers would look at these giant birds and they'd say, oh my God, each bird will probably eat an entire steer. He would say 10, 15, 20, he said, my gosh, I'll lose 20 head at a time. So they got to, they started having posses to shoot down the condors. Until about 1987, some Biologists got together and said, well, we must do something about this because there's only 15 condors left. And so they captured all of them and took them to the Los Angeles Zoo and they started a breeding program. Well, it was so successful that after a while they had a whole bunch of teenager condors and there was no room for them. So the biologists got together and they said, well, what should we do? They said, well, we're going to have to let them go. We'll have to release them. And so they said, well, they've been born in the zoo. That No one's told them where they can live or where to go or what foods to eat. They said, well, we'll just have to hope that everything is good. So they let the condors out, many of the teenagers. Well, everything was doing well. Well, until one day, up way up high in the mountains around the Pine Mountain Club area, where people would leave the windows open and the, and the doors, the sliding doors open so the cool air could come in. Now these teenagers, condors, started saying, mm, what's over there? All these curtains flying out the windows. So being curious little teenagers, they went into the houses. And they tore down the drapes, and, the, and they pulled out the bedspread, and they went in the kitchen, and they said, what is that? And they got into the refrigerator and tore, dropped the food all over the place. Well, the Pine Mountain people got real upset over that. So the biologists got together again and said, well, what are we going to do? Well, they said, we're going to have to let go one of the oldest condors because that condor can go out and mentor these young condors and teach them not to go to where the people live. And so they brought condor, uh, adult condor number eight up into an area that is called a release site. And a release site for condors is a big aviary, probably about the tw twice the size of this gazebo here. And they would bring the condors up into that area and they would stay there for about two weeks so they could acclimate themselves for being outdoors in the mountains. And so they brought adult condor number eight out there and put her in this aviary. And when the, she had been condor, uh, uh, captured, they had separated her from her mate and her mate had been released already and he had taken another mate. And so that day when they brought her and put her in the aviary, that night her old, the, her old mate came to the aviary, aviary and stood at the top of the, the cage and stayed there that night until the following morning and then flew off. 
And so they allowed uh, ACA to be released and the teenager condors learned not to go into those houses anymore and so the Pine Mountain people were fine. Uh, about 2008, we had a lot of fires here. One was in the San Diego area where there was a condor recovery program there and one of their buildings had burned down. There was a fire in San Gabriel Mountains and there was a fire over uh, Hopper Mountain over by um, uh, off of uh, the 5 Freeway in 101. Well, at that time I had traveled to Arizona because my daughter was working with, uh, with the Condor program at the Peregrine Fund in the Grand Canyon. And so when I arrived there, there were these six anxious biologists. One was on the phone, one was watching the news, and one was on the internet and another one was on the phone. And so I asked, well, what is going on? They said, well, Mother, you just came from California. There's a number of fires going on, and a lot of the condors are, are in danger. And in particular, up here, above Hopper Mountain, by Magic Mountain, there were two newborn chicks in two separate caves. And the biologists were not able to go up there and rescue the two little condors because the, the fire was so hot and it was so, so large. And so no, none of the biologists could hike up to the cave, to the ca the cave, nor anyone could could propel from a helicopter. And so that was why the the uh, biologists were so upset. Well, later afterwards, they learned that the adult condors had flown to Big Sur area, and each day a mother condor would fly through the fire and the and the smoke into those the cave to feed the little little condor spend some time there and fly out. And the following day, the father condor would fly through the fire and the smoke and enter the cave and feed the little chick. And so the, the Indian people call this a family story because as if whenever we have a fire in our house, we would do the same thing. We would take everyone out, risk ourselves, and save them. So we call that a family story. How many people have seen an owl? Does he look like other birds? No? What's different about him? Does he have big buggy eyes? And his ears stick up like this? And his beak is pointed down? Well, the Shumash people say that Mahu the owl used to look differently. One day Mahu was up flying around and he flew out and he landed down by this little tree down by the riverbank. And he began to sing. He began to sing and sing and all the animals said, stop and listen to Mahoos, he sings so beautifully. As he was sitting in that little tree break sing, singing, this great big monster came out of the little creek and frightened Mahu away. Mahu said, oh my gosh, what was that? I have never seen that monster before. Next time I see him, I will not fly away. I'm going to ask him, who are you and where did you come from? Well, another day when Mahu was out flying around, he landed on that tree again and he began to sing. And all of the animals began to listen to him. And before Mahu could say anything, that great big monster came out of that river and gave him a hug. So he, he hugged him so hard, his ears popped up and his beak was broken. And he hugged him again and out popped his eyes. And Mahu just flew away. He says, my goodness, what happened? So now when you see Mahu out flying in the trees at night, he sings, who, who, who did this to me? Who, who? And that's what the Pumas say, what happened to Mahu. There, there are um, many different languages in the world. And at one time, there was a mountain lion that lived up in a little cave and some rocks, just like those rocks over there. And, and this was up on a mountain top. And in there lived a mountain lion. The mountain lion um, got up one day and decided to take a stroll. And like this morning, how overcast it was and now the sun came out, but well, she took a little walk. Well, this mountain lion had was expecting a little mountain lion. So she went to take a walk. She crossed that little creek and kept on walking. <clears throat> and it started to sprinkle. So then she kept on walking and pretty soon that sprinkle became a, 
uh, uh, very he heavy rain. So she decided to come back and she turned around and started walking back to her cave. Well, when she got back to that little creek, it had become a great big raging river, just like in Colorado where they're having all this heavy rain. She had to cross that little creek, so she walked back and started to run as fast as she could and she jumped over that little creek. And then the little mountain lion who had been born out there where she was taking that walk took, tried to jump over that creek, but he didn't make it to the other side. So he fell in the water and in the creek and it kept rolling, rolling down and he ended up on a bank. <clears throat> the rain stopped, the sun came out and it became sunny. In the area where he was at was this little meadow and there was a flock of sheep there and they started walking around eating their little grass. <clears throat> And one of the mother sheep saw that there was something on that bank. So she went over there and she picked up the little mountain lion and took him home with her. And there she made him some hot soup and fed him. So he started growing up with the, with the sheep family. And he would go out and eat grass along the meadow with the other little lambs. And one day this big mountain lion, another one, had come out and was walking and was looking over to where all the sheep were. And those sheep immediately ran away. And the little mountain lion didn't realize that he was supposed to run away too. He was still there eating, munching his little grass. And the mountain lion looked down there and he said, my goodness, is that a little mountain lion with all those sheep? I don't know about that, let me go check this out. So he starts walking down that hill and pretty soon he's almost up to that little mountain lion and they turn around and they look at each other. And the little mountain lion says to the big mountain lion, Bah! Oh, said the big mountain lion, what did you say? And the little mountain lion says, Bah! And the big mountain lion says, oh my goodness little mountain lion, you're not a sheep, you're supposed to roar like mountain lions do. And the little mountain lion says, no, I am a, I am a sheep, Bah! And so he kept trying to convince this little mountain lion. He says, little, little mountain lion, roar. And so the little mountain lion started to try to roar. Roar, bah, roar. Pretty soon he started roaring like mountain lions do. And that story is just like our elders who are teaching our young children to speak the language. And very often we speak more than one language. And that is a story about our mountain lion and our native languages. Thank you.